Have you seen the right stuff? I'm sure you remember that famous scene where Gus Grissom uh, professed that the hatch just blew. Well, stick with me on Flywire. We're going to check out the sinking of Liberty Bell 7. Hi, I'm Scott Purdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to look at Gus Grissom's date with destiny during Project Mercury. Gus Grissom was one of the first uh, seven astronauts chosen for the space program, and he was selected for the second suborbital launch test uh, the, less than three months after Alan Shepard made the first U.S. manned spaceflight. Yuri Gagarin from uh, Russia made the original one, not, I think it was about a month before uh, Shepard launched. The first two launches of the Mercury program were meant to test the whole concept of putting a man in space in a capsule on top of a rocket, lighting it, launching it, getting to, to altitude, and then coming back, re-entering the atmosphere, landing in the ocean and getting recovered. They, they wanted to make sure that all that worked before they got more, a little more serious. And they used the Redstone rocket, and it didn't have quite the uh, thrust, the ability to get to orbit. So both Shepard and Grissom missions were suborbital. John Glenn made the third Mercury flight, uh, an orbital one, using the Atlas rocket. He had problems as well, um, and mostly with his heat shield, uh, but, you know, working out the issues. The Shepard flight was nearly flawless as he became the second human in space. Like I said, Yuri Gagarin did the first one. Uh, the Grissom mission experienced a, a significant glitch during the recovery operation. Previously, virtually everything went uh, on normal, normal. The explosive bolts holding the hatch blew during the recovery, which caused the sinking of the capsule and Grissom himself nearly drowned. So let's see the scene from the movie The Right Stuff right here. So here's the setup for the landing. The spacecraft had very little control in space. It was pretty much on a ballistic trajectory. All he could do is turn around, fire the rockets, slow down so he could start down again. Uh, a date with a splash down in 15 and a half minutes. When the helicopters approached the spacecraft, they were supposed to attach cables and the astronaut was supposed to get out by blowing the hatch and be recovered separately. Every action and phase of the flight, like I said, uh, was mapped out. Okay, they knew exactly what they were going to do, et cetera, et cetera, the small details. After landing, Grissom was supposed to arm the trigger to blow the hatch. In the actual event, he ended up being a little ahead of the, uh, the line before the helicopter got there, and he accomplished the arming procedure prior to the helicopter securing the capsule. During the recovery sequence, the hatch blew, and Grissom exited the capsule, the spacesuit filled with water from an open air inlet. He barely stayed afloat uh, long enough to be hoisted aboard the second helicopter uh, in, in backup, and uh, he nearly drowned in the process. The he first helicopter atta uh, attached to the capsule was attached, got attached to the capsule and couldn't keep the door above sea level to, and then eventually lost the capsule to the sea because full of water, it was heavier than it could carry. Controversy ensued, and Grissom, Grissom taking most of the blame for blowing the hatch uh, in some quarters. Uh, during Wally Shiraz's flight later in the Mercury program, he blew the hatch using the onboard trigger as a test and he received a large bruise on his hand from the trigger. Okay, he was already aboard the carrier at the time. As a consequence of manually operating the trigger, you end up getting a big bruise on your hand. He did it to prove that Grissom could not have activated the trigger because he did not have that bruise. 
The Right Stuff movie, uh, I, I liked the movie, it was pretty good, but it had issues, I think. Um, it depicted Grissom in a very negative manner, and that became the narrative over the years. People end up re remembering movies and not history. Remember, movies aren't history. The Na if NASA had thought so little of Grissom, why would they have chosen uh, him to fly Gemini 3, the first manned mission of Project Gemini? He, uh, just as an aside, he named the aircraft Molly Brown, sense of humor, uh, after the Broadway show, and the show was called The Unsinkable Molly Brown, and a nod to the, to the Liberty Bell 7 uh, sinking. NASA executives were not happy with the reference and did not uh, allow it to be used officially as its name. However, Gordon Cooper said the name on the radio at launch, so the name stuck. NASA didn't like that, so they didn't allow NASA astronauts to name their spa spacecraft after that until they got to Apollo when they realized they actually needed to differentiate between the command module and the lunar module. Okay, you needed to have something, and names worked out better, so there you go. Grissom was slated to be the backup pilot on Gemini uh, 6 Alpha when he was pulled and given the, the, he was in the normal rotation. He would turn him into an, another Gemini flight. Instead, he was reassigned to be command pilot of AS-204, which would go on to become Apollo 1, the first manned mission of the Apollo Moon program. When I was in college, I did a research paper on the Apollo 1 fire uh, and on the pad uh, that killed the crew, Grissom, White, and Chaffee. Maybe I'll do another video on that one, but for this video, I just want to note that during the Apollo, Grissom uh, earned the nickname Gruff Gus because of his outspoken remarks about the technical issues with the Apollo 1 capsule. Continuous changes, mistakes, problems, etc., were being made to the spacecraft almost on a daily uh, basis, and the simulator couldn't keep up pace, so he was concerned about not having everything lined out. During a plugs out test on pad 34 prior to launch, a short and damaged wiring started a raging fire. Flammable materials in the cockpit, the astronauts' flight suits, wiring, and above all, the 100% pressurized oxygen atmosphere, coupled with a bolted inward opening door, trapped the crew inside the fire. All three died on the accident in 21 Feb uh, 1967. So Deke Slayton, who was one of the original Sevens uh, astronauts, he didn't get to fly because of a medical issue, got to fly in the space lab section of the, of the program. Uh, he was in charge of the astronaut corps, and he wrote that his first choice to lead the Apollo 11 moon landing would have been Gus Grissom if he had lived. Uh, I seriously doubt that NASA thought Grissom was a screw-up. Unfortunately, that's the way the movies portrayed it. Just so what did happen to the hatch on Liberty 7? If it wasn't that uh, Grissom pushing that trigger, what happened? Without the capsule, it's kind of all speculation in a way. Going back to Grissom's description of the landing sequence, he heard a clunk, okay, he, just deep, during a debrief, he said he heard a clunk, and that was the landing bag deployment just prior to water impact. He reported that the impact with the water was milder than he thought it would be, and the spacecraft then healed over and gradually righted itself, and then when the window cleared for the water, he jettisoned the reserve parachute and activated the rescue aids, okay? The capsule was watertight, but rolling very badly in the swell. So it was a little bit uncomfortable, I imagine. Grissom prepared for recovery, disconnecting his helmet and unrolling, he had a neck dam, so he didn't have his helmet on. He had a neck dam, and that would prevent water from entering here at his, around his neck into the spacesuit. At this time, the rescue helicopters were about two miles away, and James Lewis, the pilot of the prime helicopter, who would recover the capsule, asked Grissom over the radio if he was ready for pickup. Grissom replied that he needed five minutes to, lo to log data. Okay, He's not panicking. He's, he's doing his thing. I've got to log data. I'm prepared, but I have to log data because, uh, you know, that's what he does. He's a test pilot. After logging the data, he called the helicopters in for a pickup, and then he removed the pin from the hatch cover detonator and lay back in the seat. While lying there, he heard a dull thud, and the hatch cover blew away, and water began rushing into the spacecraft. Okay. For him, time started to, to compress here, and he disconnected himself, disconnected himself uh, from the rest of his harness, 
removed his helmet and pulled himself out of the hatch as water was rushing in because the hatch was actually below water, below uh, level, sea level. He did not recall the exact sequence of events, but remembers that he had not touched the ha hatch activation system. During that egress, uh, Grissom disconnected the air ventilation hose from his suit that was connected to his suit, but he forgot to close the valve. He was in a hurry. This allowed water to enter, this, enter his spacesuit from that open valve, and while he was in the water, he was slowly sinking as water come, came into his suit, and he struggled to stay afloat. And uh, that's when the recovery helicopter, uh, the first one was recovering the airplane, or uh, the spacecraft, and then the second helicopter came in to uh, get Grissom, because the recovery wasn't paying any attention to him. They were working on the capsule. Eventually, the capsule sank beneath the waves, as I said. A chip light had illuminated in the cockpit of the recovery helicopter, and uh, Lewis determined that he could not pull the capsule out because it was heavier than his, uh, his capability in the helicopter, and he jettisoned it in about 16,800 feet of water. The second helicopter, as I said, moved in to rescue uh, during, during, while Lewis was unsuccessful struggling with the, ca the capsule. They pulled Grissom out and got him to the carrier. Approximately four years later, Grissom speculated uh, that the, the external release handle had come loose. Somebody else outside could have triggered the explosive bolts that way. And Gunter Vent, the lead pad technician from, technician from Mercury all the way through Apollo, uh, believed that the single screw holding the release lanyard had come loose. So he, he agreed with that concept that that was issue. Recovery of Liberty Bell 7 actually occurred on July 20th, uh, 1999, within about an hour or so of the moon landing uh, anniversary. During the restoration of the capsule, it was determined that the trigger and the external lanyard were not the source of activation of the explosive bolts. Way back when I went through uh, land and water survival after Air Force pilot training, we were cautioned to let the rescue sling from the helicopter touch the ground or the water, whatever you're in, uh, before touching it ourselves. This is because of static electricity. The buildup of charge can be, uh, you don't notice it, you don't realize it, but it be, can, can be considerable and hazardous if, not, if you're not grounded, okay? It's a physics thing. Air is not a good conductor, and bodies moving in or near uh, in air need to equalize that electric charge buildup, or you're gonna get, or you're gonna get that arc. When refueling your car, you, this is why it's a good idea to touch the gas nozzle to the handle, uh, nozzle handle with your hand and then touch the filler neck with the nozzle before and inserting it in the tank. You don't want an arc with gas fumes around. Uh, maybe you didn't know that. In 2021, George Leopold, uh, Grissom's biographer, and Andy Saunders, author of Apollo Remastered, used digital enhanced video shot shots, uh, video taken from that second helicopter. Using observations from Marine Lieutenant John Reinhardt, who was the co-pilot of the recovery helicopter, and he was charged with hooking up the lift cable to the capsule, uh, they looked at individual frames. Okay, they ended up stacking 17 of those frames and they got detail enough that he, they saw Reinhardt used an extension pole with a set of shears that had explosive charges there to cut the antenna. There was an antenna 22 feet long, and it was used for radio communications as a signal that, and as a signal for rescue forces could use to track the capsule. That popped out, it's one of the things that was deployed, popped out of the top of the capsule. This antenna was very important to Scott Carpenter's landing. Uh, as I remember, it was about 200, it was in the Pacific, and they missed the target by over 200 miles. Quite a long ways. The movie and other pictures about this uh, incident uh, omit this antenna. Okay, it wasn't in the movie, and if not removed, it would interfere with a successful recovery of the capsule, and as they had planned later, the astronaut inside of it, because he didn't get out. Reinhardt recalled that he touched the antenna and saw an arc appear at the same time the explosive charges went off, without him touching the switches to trigger them. And the arms cut the antenna, and then, as he was doing that, he saw the hatch come, go skipping away. It was, it was actually away a little bit away from him. It goes skips away across the water. Um, he didn't see it blow, but he saw it skipping across the water. And then a few seconds later, he saw Grissom pop out. 
of the capsule. This makes static electrical discharge as the most likely source of the hatch blowing. You see the explosive bolts uh, weren't actually explosive. They were 70 uh, one and quarter inch titanium bolts that had been weakened by a 2.2 centimeter hole. The trigger was a percussion cap that used mercury fulminate, mercury fulminate uh, to ignite a fuse which exploded causing overpressure in the hatch and that broke the weakened bolts and pushed the hatch away. They, are, they only did one test on this hatch design about a week before Grissom's launch. Apparently the mistake that set up the static electricity induced activation of the uh, explosive system occurred when Grissom uh, armed the trigger prior to the helicopter connecting with the spacecraft because they deleted that step and only did it after the connection was made. Liberty Bell 7 was the first mercury capsule to have explosive bolts used to rapidly eject the hatch door. Previously designs used those 70 bolts to secure the hatch and they had to be removed by hand. It is unfortunate for Grissom, White and Chaffee that the hatch on Apollo 1 also used bolts on an inward opening door for ingress and egress. One design modification that came from the Apollo 1 fire were latches and outward opening door to make emergency egress possible. In other words, it was not even possible. In the, Gem in the Mercury, the Gemini, or the, uh, the Apollo, the early Apollo design. By the way, this is often how security initiatives work. We can't foresee all the problems and all the pitfalls. We try hard, but hard-earned experience paves the, way, paves the way for future safety. We stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before and made the mistake, and we learn from them and press on. So it behooves us to learn our lesson. You can now see the Liberty Bell 7 on spacecraft on static display at the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center in Hutchison, Kansas. I plan on going there one of these days soon to check it out. You should go too. I've also got a Gemini there. Well, what can I say? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.